Hello and good evening. And welcome to the first part of our closing session of Should Art 2020. What an incredible week it has been, especially for all of us at G5A. First, the many inspiring and important sessions of Should Art 2020, a multidisciplinary virtual art and culture festival that began on November 3rd, celebrating our fifth anniversary, which we hope many of you were able to join. Then out of nowhere, the Maharashtra government permitted the opening of theaters at 50% capacity in Mumbai on November 5th. Coincidentally, we had planned to have a special open air early morning concert without audiences, of course, at the G5A Terrace on the 6th by two very talented young musicians, our very own team G5A, Shalaka Redkar and Ritu Jalal. And last night, our planned table read unanimously became a stage reading in our black box of Disgraced, a Pulitzer award-winning play written by Ayad Akhtar, directed by Danish Hussain, and performed by a wonderful cast, Ali Fazal, Sheena Khalid, Denzel Sequeira, Ritisha Rathor, and Zahan Kapoor. Every one of the cast and crew came on board immediately and spontaneously, and what a heartfelt performance it was. It was also memorable and moving for all of us. It was the first time we were all back at the theater after the pandemic struck some seven months ago. And to make it even more special, Fort Kitchen and Bar, our restaurant, also opened fully with most of our staff back. Much food and wine was had by all. And it must be mentioned, the tension-filled race to the White House finally came to a hopeful end hope-filled end with the election of Joe Biden as the 46th president of the United States of America. And possibly even more exciting, Kamala Harris be elected as the first woman, first African-American and first South Asian-American to serve as the vice president of the United States. Congratulations, America. And today, for the final day of Should Art 2020, we truly could not have asked for a more fitting finale. So to begin the first part of our closing session, Islands of Freedom, Words, Art, Resistance, I would like to welcome both Tista Setalwad and Kalpana Sharma, Bravehearts Extraordinaire. Tista, as you all know, has been at the helm of battling the corrosive politics of hate and division, pushing for institutional accountability and transparency in cases of targeted violence, exposing institutional bias and prejudice. A journalist, civil rights activist, and educationist, she is the, the co-editor and co-founder of sabrangindia.in, an alternate journalism portal that gives focus to grassroots, grassroots journalism around human rights protection. She is also secretary and chief executive of the Citizens for Justice and Peace, a human rights movement dedicated to upholding the freedom and constitutional rights of all Indians in the courts and beyond. She has been working tirelessly to include issues of diversity, conflict resolution, and peace building within the Indian classroom through CJP's Code Education for a Plural India program, while working to evolve legal and paralegal training for forest dwellers and Adivasis around the emancipatory Forest Rights Act of 2006. More recently, she legally assisted thousands of victims of the stateless crisis in Assam, while also working to understand and expose the Partisan Citizenship Amendment Act 2019, passed by the Government of India, along with the impending, threatened, All India National Re Register of Citizens and National Population Register, NRIC and NPR. Kalpana Sharma is an independent journalist, columnist, and author. She has written The Silence and the Storm, Narratives of Violence Against Women in India, and Rediscovering Bharavi, Stories from Asia's Largest Slum. In almost five decades as a journalist, with various leading and independent publications like Himmat Weekly, Indian Express, Times of India, and The Hindu, she has maintained a strong focus on environmental development issues as well as gender. 
Kalpana has also been an integral part of G5A's earlier executive council, which worked to build the foundational base for G5A. And so it is even more special for me to have you here tonight, Kalpana. Thank you for all that work and time that you gave. I hope you feel gladdened to see where G5A is today. Indeed. Kalpana, now over to you. I will be here without camera and sound and later to help with questions if required. Thank you. Thank you, Anuradha. Um, it actually is, um, first of all, let me say congratulations to you and to your entire team at G5A. Uh, for the five years when we first started talking about it and you invited some of us to be part of that group. Um, you know, it was very hard to envisage how this space would grow and uh, become what it is. And uh, I think it's a tribute to you and the others that you have actually developed it uh, into this theme that we have for today, an island of freedom, you know, where people feel free to come and express themselves, to experiment, to uh, talk about the issues of that concern them to perform. Um, and, you know, G5A over these five years has really uh, been exemplary in the way in which it has um, uh, created this space. So congratulations, Anuradha and all uh, the G5A team. I'm very Thank you. It, it, happy and privileged no, like to I, it. I've been asked to come on again. So I've, 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 I decided to come in and just say that uh, it really is, a, uh, G5A is really a collaborative effort. And I've always maintained that it could become this only because of the collective uh, voices and energies that, that you know, we brought to in the making uh, of G5A. So, you know, one of the things that, uh, the, one of the reasons that I felt um, it was important that both you and Tista were part of this conversation um, is because I, you know, we, we all feel very strongly that the arts um, must uh, uh, be involved in conversations that are not just restricted to the formal uh, and the, the, the sort of practice and theories of art, but really, really to engage uh, deeply with our current uh, context, um, whether it's soci sociological, uh, philosophical and political. So, so uh, while you were sort of wondering whether, you know, how you, you would fit in, it is absolutely essential. And I think also fitting that it is in a way a closing session. So we, we, it is really about the way forward now, you know, how do we all work together uh, to, to enable this dialogue uh, to be kept alive and um, continually informed? Yeah, thank you. Um, so when Anuradha mentioned this uh, idea of the session, um, you know, I'm a journalist, so I'm in the prosaic business of uh, writing nonfiction. <laughs> so it's a bit of a distance from many of the things that, but of course I love art and I love all aspects of it. But then I began thinking of this idea of um, the islands of freedom and, and also to look at how resistance and, you know, the kind of art in the formal and the informal sense that resistance has produced. And this is not just resistance to a regime, but it's also resistance to uh, dominant narratives in a society, which can be set not necessarily by the government, but by dominant groups within a society that choose to set that narrative. Um, uh, you know, feminists, for instance, have, have resisted uh, the dominant narrative that is set by a system of patriarchy that basically uh, uh, has made little girls grow up feeling they're somehow less than, you know, what the boys are. And, and this is the kind of resistance. And so there are many other forms of resistance. So it'd be an interesting thing. I thought with that Tista, who's of course an activist and been involved in, in many things, apart from the fact that she and I are both journalists, uh, that we should explore this thing of, you know, what, what is it that resistance produces by way of expression, by way of images uh, that also are part of our whole history of art in a country or in our society, but often goes unacknowledged. Um, and we know that even literature, for instance, some of the most wonderful and uh, uh, beautiful writing has come out of this kind of, you know, people working in an atmosphere of oppression and then finding the words to convey what they believe. And, 
for generations, people have read these texts and been inspired by it. So that is an aspect to look at. And I do feel that, you know, both dissent of a direct kind or indirect kind and resistance, that they kindle in us the desire to find the voice in different ways, find our own voices, find the voice of the community of which we are a part. Because the object is not just the moment that we are doing, it's also to memorialize the context, you know, so it's not a poster or a wall painting for that particular time, but it actually is part of, it, it has context and therefore it is part of history and needed to, needs to be remembered. And in that context, I think uh, in recent years, I would say that uh, Rohit Vemula's death by suicide in 2016, the young student from the University of Hyderabad, uh, really triggered memories of generations of oppression and exclusion that go so often unnoticed. And as I said, unacknowledged in Indian society, uh, that of caste. And it generated not just a debate and not just anger, of course, which is absolutely justified and not just sorrow, but a desire to find ways to express all this in ways that reach out to ordinary people, to people who have not thought that the death by suicide of a young student actually signifies something much deeper, much more rotten that is part of our society and that needs to be challenged and changed. Um, again, in recent times, I would say uh, the whole uh, countrywide campaigns against the Citizenship Amendment Act and the National Register of Citizens last year, um, uh, it was clear that it was not just about Muslims because of the manner in which it drew especially young people you know, who felt outraged that something like this could come into a country like ours, which is so diverse. And, you know, I just, I have, I didn't travel to Delhi or to other places, but just in Mumbai, uh, at the demonstration at Azad Medan, at uh, uh, Mumbai Bagh, as it was called, in, in central Mumbai, and uh, in August Kanti uh, Medan, uh, the works of art and poetry, the drama that was enacted, you know, not in closed spaces, but on the street, uh, the painting on the walls, the placards, even on clothes, on banners. You know, I thought it was an amazing outpouring of creativity that I certainly, I mean, I've been covering a lot of these issues for my 50 years as a journalist. And I honestly cannot remember a blossoming of this kind of creativity as I saw those days. And, I, you know, all these people were untrained. I spoke, spoke to some of them, the ones who had created these posters. And they're not trained artists. And yet... They found ways to <laughs> express their resistance. Um, in fact, if we go back further, you know, the women's movement in the late 70s and early 80s, uh, there was not so much of kind of visual uh, expression, but there was more in terms of theater, for instance, you know, the street theater and uh, the anti dowry um, uh, dramas that were done in Mumbai, for instance, Mulgi Zalio, which was performed all over the place. Uh, in Delhi, Nandita Das in the very first session talked about Saftar Hashmi's group and how they performed. So again, you know, theater was taken out of a closed stage, a proscenium stage, out into the street as a form of expression and uh, was a part of the creativity which we have to remember. And I think, um, you know, uh, the fact that this was performed by ordinary people with a passion to tell a story or convey a message is, I think, um, something that was the backstory, the real story in a sense of these creations. And then let me just, before I uh, ask Tista to come in, let me just talk about this islands of freedom concept. You know, that is something actually very dear and personal to me because I went through the emergency as a journalist. I was working with a small uh, magazine called Himmat, which was uh, founded by Raj Mohan Gandhi. And we had to, you know, struggle against censorship and, uh, very little in terms of finance to keep it going, but somehow we kept it going. But I realized then that even in the darkest period, you know, where literally, if you said something, you would be arrested under MISA, that was the law at that time, um, that you can create the spaces, you can create these islands of freedom, you know, it's a risk, of course, at such times. But if you don't expand those spaces, then even the little space that is there will go. I mean, that is the lesson I learned. And that is what many of us carried forward uh, afterwards when we joined mainstream media, that even there, there are other ways in which spaces for expression are restricted. 
by ownership patterns, by the kind of government in power. Uh, today we see a lot of that, but even there, there are spaces that we must not only use, but we must expand. And I think through that, uh, it allows a whole lot of people who don't think of themselves as part of the art world strictly. They don't even think of themselves as writers or poets or musicians, but it allows them to actually discover that all of us have that in us and we can find ways to express it because we believe that we ought to be doing that, you know. So um, I think going forward, you know, one, one longs for more of this in India. And I feel very bad that many of these things have been erased, uh, especially the public art. Uh, and it's very good that Tista's group, Sabram, has actually documented so much of it. And I do hope that others also have, so that because this is something that we must keep as a record of what happened, because it, it, there are people who want to rewrite history and erase this whole uh, period of resistance from our history. And we must not permit that. And we have to find ways of uh, uh, keeping that memory alive. So uh, Tista, over to you. I mean, you have been very much yes. part of many of these struggles. So Yeah, thoughts. actually, I want to just put it in a slightly different framework because I feel that while it's very important what G5A is doing, and I'll pay my own tribute to G5A at the end, not in the beginning. But uh, I just want to say that, uh, you know, for many of us who, uh, whether it's feminists, whether it's activists, whether it's... Uh, uh, whatever we are doing, if we come from the more privileged section, which all of us do here, uh, I think it's very important to also remember what some of this uh, resistance implies. And I think I would very much uh, want to point to particularly uh, January of 2016, because from 4th of January onwards, you know, when this entire batch of students was brutally chucked out of their hostel rooms and their scholarship uh, uh, was denied to them for seven months before that. I'm talking about Rehut, Rohit Vemula and seven others. And that is where in the precincts of the uh, Hyderabad Central University, they set up something called the Velivada. Now, I would be very honest to admit that I did not know what a Velivada meant, even as a very senior journalist in the profession. And I don't think many people did among journalists who would call themselves progressive. Velivada means Dalit ghetto in Telugu, you know. And the way they turned that term around and the way they appropriated it within the precincts of an extremely oppressive university where Appa Rao Podil, the vice chancellor, was extremely brutal with students. I mean, physically brutal. I mean, we saw beatings, we saw firings by the police, we saw the way the Telangana government behaved. But they created this amazing space where they were painting art on the... And I request Shadda to show that link of Sabrang while I speak instead of seeing my face, it, it, it's just amazing what they create. And tragically, on 17th of January, the institutional murder of Rohit took place. I and mean, what the movement calls institutional murder, not suicide, because they believe it's the institutional discrimination uh, that many Dalit students have to go through that actually led Rohit to take his own life. And I remember being, as a journalist, being so shaken because why we, 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 uh, we, we, many of us rightly claim that we are different from the others and we proudly claim that there are still so many structures of injustice that we are not aware of, which are everyday injustices, which is the injustice of caste, which is the injustice of caste exclusion, uh, what the scavenger goes through, what the sanitation worker goes through, what Vimal Thorat says as a Dalit feminist, that even the Indian feminist movement has not taken cognizance of, which is Dalit feminist writing, which is writing about the chani, which is the piece of dried meat, which a Dalit woman has to cure and feed her family with because there's no other food to feed. So I think it's also what it means to us because it opens our eyes. This, I think, is the Jamia one, which we are seeing on the screen just now, Bolki Lab Azad Pere, which is the, which I'll come to in a minute. But the previous ones were the ones from the Veli Vada, uh, if you could just go back a bit to the Velivada ones, uh, this is the Jamia Street, and this, uh, yeah, these are the Velivada ones. It's amazing art because they tell you different layers of discrimination. They tell you about the SCS, the admission office in universities. And uh, I think what we need to understand about caste discrimination is that it's an everyday discrimination. There are rapes against Dalit women every day. 
and that many more rapes against Dalit women compared to other women. So I think for me, art is resistance as a journalist, as an observer, as an activist, as a documentalist is also interrogating myself and my understanding of structural mm. inequality. Because my understanding of this inequality grows with every such exposure to this kind of resistance. And uh, you know that uh, uh, there's a lovely, one of these drawings is of Rohit, where it said 1989 forever. Because I mean, it's, he, Rohit imagined himself in the fashion of Carl Sagan. He, he entered the university on the general merit candidate, not as a on the SCST, as many upper caste people feel that the reservations are in fact unnecessary. And he dreamed of being a thinker and a scientist, but he took his own life because the, the scholarship was denied him and humiliation was uh, uh, you know, actually poured on him by the university authority. And then there's that letter of, Dalit, uh, of Rohit, which he wrote to the university uh, vice chancellor almost a month before he, he died, which was December 18th where he says every time a Dalit student gets admitted, give them a, give them a little bottle of poison and a hangman's rope as well, along with the admission card. And I'm saying this because I really believe that we should continue the movement to try and get that letter into our social science textbooks, you know. And, and then coming, coming to the anti-CA, anti-NPR, anti-NRIC protests. What amazed me about these protests, apart from the street art we saw at Jamia and the uh, Mumbai bag art and the Roshan bag art in Ilhabad. What, what amazed me is the three or four nazams or poems that capture the imagination of young people. And I, I want to say this because there's something about the South Asian land which is oral history oriented. We are much more an oral people than a written word people. Okay, So the nazam, the poetry, the the, the uh, Kabir Ka, Kabir Ke uh, Dohe or the Tukarams, uh, uh, you know, which, which the Varkaris even sing today when they are doing the Pandarpur Yatra. It's part of people's everyday life. So how come and what happened that the Hindustani, the Kharibori, the Urdu, despite the hate mongering that is going on politically, it was that language that captured the imagination of young people, not just Muslims. So whether it was Hamde Khenge, of affairs, you know, which, you know, we know that Iqbal Banu in a sari in 1986 in military Ziyaz, Pakistan, she just fired everybody with that, with that, with that, uh, Fez's poetry, you know, because Fez Saab, when he recited poetry was quite dull, but he was a brilliant poet. But Iqbal Banu gave magic to those lines, amazing lines. And, you know, what are those lines that, I mean, they talk about the, uh, when the when the you know when the injustice will be completely fitted away like tufts of cotton wool, and you know then taaj uchale jayenge, tak to chale jayenge, you know that sort of thing, and it is that that captured the imagination of Indians, you know regardless of the hate mong. Then your 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 uh, Habib Jalil's Dastur, I mean that was another point. I mean I found Facebook. I've got twenty renderings on Facebook. This young woman sitting with her puppy on her lap, beautiful image with a red hue behind her. And she's saying, we, we refuse this kind of law, which is unjust. We will refuse it. That's what Habib Jalib, Jalib says in that poem, uh, Nazam. And you have people all over in South, South Africa, Indian standing and singing this. So, you know, it is also the spoken word of poetry and music, which captured the imagination, apart from this amazing physical imagery that we saw in Jamia, where you had the oppressor's images painted on, on the streets in that sense. People were walking over them every day, the people whom they saw as oppressors. And my ultimate favorite in the anti-CA, anti-NPR protest was Hussein Hedri, you know. And the first time he uttered it was in Azad Medan, Mumbai, you know, to a crowd of 25,000. And I just want to say four of those lines because he said, Hindustani Musliman, you know, that lovely poem, beautiful poem. When he said, Dakkan se hu, UP se hu, Bhopal se hu, Delhi se hu. Kashmir se hu, Gujarat se hu, and they cheers from the crowd, you know. And this har unchi nichi jat se hu, me hu julaha mochi bi, me doctor bi hu darji bi, mujh me Gita ka saar bi hai, aur Urdu akbar bi hai, mere ek mahina Ramzan bi hai, aur mene kia Ganga me snan bi hai. So he's questioned the homogeneity of this entire stereotyping that is being pressed on the community brutally through violence, 
We saw it in Gujarat 2002. We saw it in Malyana, Hashimpura. The, the kind of genocidal violence that the Muslim community has been experiencing over decades. But the manner in which he came out, a young, uh, a young uh, uh, talented writer who's been writing for Bollywood. And I must pay tribute to Bollywood for keeping the uh, Urdu and Hindustani alive for people that allows it to resonate at times like this, you know. So I think for me, it was amazing that it was the Hindustani Urdu uh, Nazam and poetry that captured the imagination at such a time, given the regime uh, we live under, you know. So uh, there are very interesting patterns. And then, of course, there's Kashmir, uh, which I think also we need to refer to, which is so tragic uh, and yet uh, so full of hope because uh, you have uh, Said uh, Mushtaba Rizvi trying to set up Gallery One just like uh, G5A uh, over there in Srinagar. But unfortunately, authorities destroyed it in 2015 because he tried to set it up, gave it a space for uh, visual art, for poetry reading. Now he's moved the entire effort to a cafe where they come and just read poetry, etc. Because so it's not a permanent uh, identifiable place. Yeah. Uh, and I remember that other poem, which came from that rapper in Kashmir, Raushan Ilahi, though his official outside name is uh, MC Kash, where he says, I protest. It's just, I protest. And it's a rap song, you know, and that captured the imagination across India, South Asia and this thing. And then the story, Munno, a boy from Kashmir, which was written by the friend of uh, Sayyid Mushtaba Rabbi. So like Kalpana said, whether it's the written word fiction, whether it's the visual art, Somehow or the other, uh, I think, uh, uh, and you know, I also want to say one thing. I think we need to also interrogate the communities that are doing this because this has been one of my obsessions. Uh, when you look at black uh, jazz music, uh, you know, in North America, and uh, you look at black Jewish North American music also, there's a close connection. Uh, and uh, I, I also believe that with the kind of institutionalized discrimination, that sections of our society have, have been made to uh, feel pre-independence because of the caste structure and post-independence because of, you know, the prejudice caused by partition and lots of other issues related to the Muslim community. You find that this sections, in fact, unlike IAS, IPS, mein aapko Muslim Dalit bahut kam milenge. you get more Dalits because there's reservation. But Muslims you won't get in IPS, IAS, in formal jobs because there is institutionalized discrimination. But look at sports, you look at the arts, you look at Bollywood, you look at music, where there is no glass ceiling of institutional discrimination and this community is flowering, you know? So I think we need to also see. And uh, I remember attending this fascinating lecture by uh, Gulam Muhammad Sheikh once on Pahari painting, on Pahari painting. And he said that, you know, the, the, those who created it, uh, were not allowed to put their signature on it because it was going to be put in the temple structure, in the holy structure of the either the home mandir or the institutional mandir. So they had to sign off their rights to it because they were part of artisan guilds, uh, many Dalits, many OBCs, many Muslims who would create these wonderful pieces of art. And then they would just sign their right away because then it was entering into a structural form of uh, exclusion. So I think these connections for me are also fascinating because, uh, because they continue in India today, 70, 75 years after quote unquote independence. Uh, I think many of our structural exclusions do, do uh, uh, carry on. And uh, uh, the question say the Dalit feminist is raising or has been raising for the last uh, uh, 25 years. Not that she or he does not identify with the mainstream feminist movement. But she's saying that my issues are life and blood issues. They are about collecting water from the well. They are about carrying filth on my head. They're about eating uh, dried meat. So even that should be part of the feminist discourse. I think these internal dialectics are also very, very fascinating uh, to open our own minds more and more so that we see what these islands of uh, freedom mean, you know? Yeah, what they mean for different people. So Dalit Lives Matter comes up, uh, you know, after the Black Lives Matter campaign. And we've had extremely intense debates on groups, extremely in intimate groups, feminist groups. But they've been very, very, very angry debates with Dalit feminists saying that, you know, do not appropriate our language. So I think we need to also be dealing with that. In a, in a, and we are trying, everyone is trying to deal with it. But I just wanted to flag that issue because it is there. It yeah. is there. 
and yeah. it's something that uh, if you are open enough we can navigate because i don't think anybody is going to feel threatened by it uh, uh, i think one of the most ama- um, a question that was asked to me by a student a professor of law was about uh, nationalism the flag uh, and uh, uh, how do i see the flag after the ca npr protest it's a fascinating question because Yeah. you know all of us would react to the quote and quote imposed nationalism uh, in a certain way because uh, so i had i had i, I thought about it. i said give me a couple of while i thought about it and i said no it's very strange because we have a regime in power today who did not actually claim the tiranga till 2000 officially on the rss headquarters you did not have the tiranga because they didn't want a tiranga because for them the tiranga meant a certain amount of diversity uh, acceptance of uh, uh, composite nationhood uh, and now of course by putting that same tiranga on the accused at katua or the uh, the katua rape or the accused of any other heinous rape like apna uh, mohammed eklaf's rape they they wrap the tiranga you're actually trying to besmirch what the flag stood for by saying that this is our flag now you know it, it's almost as good yeah. as the bagua but what the ca anti ca anti npr nrc protest did He said they amazingly reclaimed the tiranga. While they were reclaiming the constitution, and Baba Sahib Ambedkar, and Maulana Azad, and Bhagat Singh, they were also reclaiming the tiranga, saying that this is our flag too, and you can't exclude us. You cannot exclude our existential uh, reality in this country. You know, we we stayed here as a matter of choice, and that's what Hussein Haidri says so beautifully. But that's what the protesters in Jamia are saying. in aligarh da singh in elhabad da singh mumbai bagh da singh karnataka singh i mean we had 69 bags come up after shahin bagh 69 inspired by shahin bagh yeah. and not that time magazine is my greatest makka of journalism but if you have a modi there and a <laughs> bilkis dadi there it means something right yeah. it means something yeah. somewhere Absolutely. that in terms of the balance of power so i just wanted to flag Absolutely. some of these issues because Uh, for me, it's a constant learning experience of trying to unravel one's own positioning on these issues. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, Tista, you know, to, coming back to the theme of this, should art be engaged? Something that <laughs> Anuradha said. Um, I think for me, um, <coughs> you know, taking it from say the women's movement in the late seventies or the eighties to the anti uh, CANRC, uh, as I said, those. Uh, those demonstrations brought forth this kind of creativity that actually i have not seen uh, there have been many struggles you know there have been struggles by adivasi there have been workers struggles um, and for a mo- for a time that they do produce their own iconography and and uh, you know uh, ways in which they they uh, express their uh, resistance or their protest but uh, this particular phase last year was extraordinary not just because even though it was the muslims who would be affected it drew together especially young people of yeah. all types yeah. and um and as as i said it was not just they didn't come forth only to join the protest but they actually contributed you know uh, by making these handmade posters and and coming there so um you know you were following many of these movements so what would you say what is it that triggered uh this kind of desire in so many people i mean in azad maidan i remember i just went around asking uh, many of those who were there i said have you be especially the younger people i talked to i said uh, do you go to demonstrations all the time i mean do you participate in a lot of these things um in your college or elsewhere and you know the majority of those i spoke to they said they'd never been to a protest before yeah. this was the first time they were going and they all of them said at the end of it many of them said to me we feel so energized uh you know and some groups had come from various colleges who had were part of you know groups that are sort of activists within their own universities but these were random kids who came from all over and uh, stood there the entire time during the azad madan meeting which went on for a long long time and everybody was standing and they were listening with absolutely rapt attention and you know many of them had handwritten posters some of them had drawn things and you know i thought to myself where is this coming from is it is it because now this form of expression all around the world we are seeing that it is happening 
Um, is it that it's this generation that sees that, you know, they're much more visual? Uh, I mean, Instagram, which I'm not part of, uh, and my nieces constantly nag me about it. But, you know, I mean, the visual is what appeals more than the written words. So all of us who write these copious articles, we know that the younger generation only read on their phone, you know, so they're not going to read anything that's more than 500 words. But a visual is something that seems to trigger them off. So what do you think? I mean, I was not able to, I was not able to fully understand. And I didn't go to Delhi, so I don't know about Jamia. Um, I have written about that group, Pinjra Thor, you know, who got involved and have been now implicated in the Gujarat, uh, in the Delhi riots, uh, which is again an extraordinary group, the way it's come up, the way, again, their ways in which they've expressed, starting with only something to do with hostile timings. They have moved on to larger issues uh, of women's rights, of Dalit rights, of human rights. Um, so so what, what is your understanding as you engage... Uh, with a lot of these uh, people. Who you know, are. I think Kalpana, it's, I mean, I remember, I have to go back to my experience with the Pakistan-India People's Forum for Peace and Democracy because we set this forum up in 1994. Asma was still there. Asma, or icon, Asma Jangir. Just stay with Asma Jangir, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so, I mean, Asma, yeah, Asma Jangir is the icon of a kind of a lawyer activist, fiery activist uh, uh, from uh, Lahore, Pakistan, who was the, uh, uh, we, we lost her a couple, uh, two years ago, two years and two and a half years ago, yeah. she died of a heart attack. But she was fiery. She was. Uh, she went to jail. She fought for the minorities in Pakistan, and she also visited India, by the way, in 2009 as a special rapporteur uh, for freedom of religion by the United Nations. And I remember her visiting Gujarat with me. But I mean, anyway, anyway, that's that's a separate issue. So my point is that we tried to form a forum which is still very active and alive, the Pakistan-India People's Forum for Peace and Democracy. And I'm mentioning it because, you know, uh, Kalpana coming from India, uh, I think a lot of us tend to be very sanctimonious about our democracy. We tend to be very, very, uh, you, I mean, I remember that time those discussions were kind of because I, Rahman Saab, who was there, uh, who's, still, uh, who's still very much there, thank God, he has this very crypt humor and he knew how to cut sanctimonious Indians to size, you know. So when there would be a question and we address a joint press conference in Lahore, we address a joint press conference in Delhi, then we address a joint press conference in Kolkata, uh, you know, when Jyoti Basu was still alive. And I remember Indian journalists would generally say, you know, what is it about, uh, you know, I mean, uh, how is it? In, I mean, we've got democracy, you know, after all, you're the ones who don't have you. So I remember, I remember two lines that Rahman Sab told this journalist in Kolkata. That she said, do you have any idea what it means to live under a military dictation? Okay. And there was a stunned silence in the room. And uh, then the people sort of saying, he said, our best our art, our best music, and our best uh, songs of resistance have come in that period. And I'm coming back to your question, because Shima Kirmani, who's a friend of ours, I'm sure she's a friend of yours, a feminist from Karachi, who dances Kathak. In, uh, even today in Dargahs in Pakistan, wearing a sari, and she looks very much like Anuradha, she'll wear a sari and the big bindi, at great risk to her life, but she will dance the katha, you know. Now, we had no feeling of this, except for the 18, 20 months of the emergency, India has had no experience of this. So what happened, I think, with the anti-CA, anti-NPR protest, that I think it was, it was something about, it was about the five and a half, six years. It was about anti-CA, anti-NPR also, but the young people who were coming out were also coming out because it was like blowing the lid of the bottle. You know, how many fronts has the Modi regime opened up after 2014? There were so many repressive acts, one after the other, one after the other on different sections. And this was almost like something that was the last straw on the camel's back. So I think it was also a realization that if we don't speak up now, we won't get a chance to speak up. And I, I, the way young Muslim, uh, and we have to give it, I mean, I, I feel no shame in saying it, it was the young Muslim student leadership that came forward, others joined, you know. Yeah. Even the Muslim leader, religious leadership was nowhere in the picture, nowhere in the picture. It was a young student professional leadership who came out risking, and of course the women, uh, the and dadis many, and the mousies and the khalas, completely, yeah. and also unlettered older women, unlettered older women of Shahinbagh, who came out like tigresses because Jamia was attacked physically on December 15th. 
that's why shine bark started they said if you're going to attack our children in our community we'll be on the streets so it was a community protest but in the best democratic traditions in the best emancipatory traditions and using an emancipatory language so i think that kind of captured the imagination of young people like you said like your niece and uh, my daughter who are much better at instagram and videos and photos no so i also remember at azad maidan i was both on and off the stage and i remember corporate lawyers women who were working in corporate law offices had walked down and said we were had to be here today you know so people who don't normally attend attend protests at all were there uh and of course though maybe in bombay uh, mumbai maybe 50% were muslim but there were a good 50% who were not muslim yeah. like kalpana rightly said though it was led by a muslim concern legitimate concern that you're trying to completely uh deny us our citizenship uh, so i think it was extraordinarily inspirational and the fact that there were women there young people there also tended to take away the patriarchal hegemony of many such protests even when they're from the left side when workers have it and all that they became more creative because there were women leading it there were young people leading it mm-hmm. so the normal hegemony you know the structures that who will speak who will not speak who will do what all those were broken because everybody was speaking shine bag whoever went there everybody spoke i mean i went there three times i didn't speak all the time but any time you, you just wanted to be there because there was an amazing energy and it it stretched for virtually 2 kilometers right under the bridge and by the time and it was there for two and a half three months almost and there were bookshops on the road there were uh, there was uh, there was mugs i bought there were little i bought about 15 different things i love shine bag i love this i mean amazing things were cropping up all the time you know so people were also enjoying themselves like people enjoy themselves at such protests and i think people needed to enjoy themselves after six and a half years of this regime 2014 and 2019 uh, people needed this complete uh, uh, i remember this conversation in shine bag where women said that yes it is about caa but it's also about mama de clark's lynching it's also about the lynchings that are taking place unquestioned not that we've not had riots against muslims before but the prime minister not speaking nobody is speaking up you know so this kind of pent up feeling that you know we need to assert ourselves or everything will be lost i think that was very much there in 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 these protests and uh, and let's not forget that what the up government what what you mentioned in delhi the up government tried to do in uh, the, the repression has been sickening i mean the covid-19 pandemic has been used to not just uh, break down these protests but to criminalize the protests so you've had uh, apart from the 700 fir's against muslims generally and 600 hindus for the violence 22 young Muslim persons have been booked under the uapa including uh, you know uh, sarfra sarfra uh, what's her name from kashmir who was released because she was pregnant uh, sarfra yeah. safura zargar gulfashan apna ishrat jahan from the khureji protest umar khalid the uh, devangana Uh, all I mean, natasha two 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 young women activists of pindra tod they are all being criminalized for simply participating in a protest and in uttar pradesh in both lucknow kanpur mau there have been 270 such nsa cases lodged which we don't even know documentally they've not been properly documented because every time activists try to document them i was in a webinar this afternoon there's an nsa against those activists So the kind of terror in Uttar Pradesh is unbelievable. They are just trying to break the back of these protests there. So the story is not over. I'm afraid, you know, it's going to get really bad. And I, uh, um, it's, 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 it's. I mean, that's not the subject here. But I just want to say that though those protests were very euphoric, the, the what, what, what people who led those protests are going through today is tragic. It's really tragic. It's a criminalization yeah. of protests. No, I mean, yeah. yeah, but I think so while. Uh, you know, while Sorry. Sorry, yeah, Anuradha. No, I, no. I just wanted to, yeah, I just wanted to say that, you know, the subject is really about all of this in a way. Yeah. But yeah. but I think what we need to, uh, I think also do, uh, Tisa, is broaden the the base uh, of where we have these conversations, so that yeah. there are just there is that critical mass that we can develop, you know, yeah. and and so. so i i feel that you know the other thought that that uh, struck me was that um a lot of this kind of art or the outpouring as you were you were talking about both of you 
um, is really on, it, interestingly, it's on the margins of mainstream uh, art. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and so, so what we need to really do collectively, at least, is, is that we ensure that it finds its uh, proper place within that mainstream conversation. Um, because, uh, because otherwise, like you rightly said, Kalpana, it's going to um, not only disappear, but it's, uh, it's going to, in a sense, sort of muzzle that kind of voice if we don't um, you know, uh, protect it and in fact reinforce it. So I think, I think um, it's, it's extremely important that all of us within the arts especially do um, embrace and really understand these issues. And like we've uh, often talked about earlier is how do we do that? And so really uh, with Should Art, that is one of the things that we've been wanting to do is to, to really set a base for uh, the journey forward where we are able to make it as a holistic a conversation as possible. Yeah. So we deal with the formal aspects of art, but also also very much uh, the content and the, the sort of agenda with which we approach our work. So one, so, so, you know, we, one project, yeah. uh, Anuradha, I would urge maybe G5A or somebody to take on, as I yeah. was saying, is because of the nature of these protests last year and how unusual and how broad they were in the way they drew together uh, people, uh, and much of it was on public spaces and it's been erased. You yeah, know? Yeah. But there are people, yes. I mean, Tista has got some of those pictures. Others must have got photographs. Yes. And so we should find a way before... To archive, them, to archive them, to archive them. Of actually documenting and making sure it's there. A and live archive, true. you know, a live and archive. Live archive. Yeah, and I yeah. it now because many times these things come and go and people forget, you know. And I think yes. remembering no, absolutely. the anti-CA NRC is... Uh, to point out, a, as you say, that that uh, this is part of art, part of uh, poetry, part of theatre, uh, which is in our country and should be remembered and commemorated and memorialized the way we would do the formal stuff, you know. Yeah. And yeah. it requires effort. And now, especially because the very fact of joining a protest is being uh, criminalized, you know, by this government. Yeah. Uh, yeah. In future, when something like this comes up in the next year or whatever, naturally young people are going to hesitate, you know, or they might be held back by others. Yeah. So we may not see a recreation of the kind of effervescence that we saw uh, for some time to come, you know. So I think that is even more important that we do yeah. recognize and record. May it I just share two more things? I just thought of two more things which I wanted to Absolutely. share. Absolutely. Yeah. Is that in yeah. our very, very painful and bitter struggle for the justice for the uh, victims of 2002, survivors of 2002 in Gujarat, uh, what gave me strength and what gave the survivors strength because there was a kind of a group of 25,000 families, so 5,000 key people and the legal process was taking so long and even, you know, even with a success story we had of 172 convictions, etc. There was a whole period where the Supreme Court would be quiet, nothing would be happening, okay. So we found that the annual memorial, annual memorializing mm. of the uh, of of what happened, not in the same way, not in a kind of just a martyrdom kind of way where you kind of beat your breast, but reflective at Gulberg Society. We did mm. that every year, you know, every year, and we've got that well documented. And when the ten year mark came in two thousand twelve, I still remember. Uh, and I'd like to pay tributes to my good friend, Benita Desai, who was a, a photographer from NID, a photography professor from NID, Sri Vishwanathan and other. We actually brainstormed for six months before that. And we converted the whole Gulberg Society into a kind of a memorial of resistance. And I mean, if you see, Rakesh Sharma was there that whole day, he actually videoed the whole thing for us. It was ac actually so inspiring because... We, we worked on it, uh, Kalpana. We worked on the television coverage. We made a, a reel out of it. We worked on the press coverage. We made a reel, so it ran in one of the broken down bungalows. We had a whole tree created by students of NID. And the, pro and the process was so crazy because we managed to reach out to kids, kids from the quote-unquote other side who had been told a different story about Gujarat. So they, they actually broke down and they said, you know, you enabled us to actually open our eyes to this tragedy of what happened to people in our own city. Mm. <clears throat> and then I approached my old friend Shubha Mudgal and I said, please, please, will you give a live concert there? Mm. And she agreed. 
she agreed so then ram rahman helped me and we actually curated that concert in the open at gulberg she sat on the terrace of a bungalow of kasim bai where 19 people had been massacred and i can't tell you that experience when i saw that video i have it i have I've been wondering when i should put it publicly because i you know the kind of fractiousness it will generate but i i mean i i so i've showed it privately to 600 people in different different audiences and it's an amazing rendition she chose she chose every rendition with care she anish pradhan and sudeep patwadan were sitting there we did this backdrop lighting everything and we got a professional thing we recorded it beautifully and for those 2000 survivor families sitting there and who had been there the whole day uh it was such a cathartic experience out of the violence because uh, they ran up to her and they said you understood our pain and that's why you sang like that and in the daytime we had trupti who's now no more with us trupti shah my activist friend who unfortunately died in from baroda so trupti and rohit curated this entire thing in the afternoon where families had saved lives you know so we wanted the positive stories to come so it was a whole day long curation of the memorial which was just incredible so that was one thing i wanted to share uh, we have this documented we need to put it up somewhere uh, because it's all there in our uh, you know electronically etc unfortunately gulberg society remains under such threat that we can't keep it up there and the second thing is after covid pandemic you know when we had that migrant uh, mass migration of people when the urban middle class and even journalists opened their eyes to the migrant worker and the story i'm talking about the last 7 months you know march april some amazing journalist friends in delhi with the, from the hindu you know they suddenly got in touch with me on twitter and they just sent me this image of this young boy shivam who had done this wonderful painting kalpana beautiful you know in red with with footsteps of migrants you know and it was a beautiful rendition of what he saw he just he is the son of a domestic worker his mother is a domestic help single mother family very distressed conditions but his his vice principal in a government school has helped him encouraged him to keep doing art so the vice principal would keep giving him coloring so he sat and did this beautiful uh, artwork and all of us got so enamored with it we are now all contributing a little bit every month so that he can go to art school you know because of what anuradha raman from the hindu put out and that particular artwork has been bought by somebody in bangalore so these are moments when you know things that can happen and do happen uh, and uh, he's a wonderful boy this shivam is a wonderful boy and we did a long interview with him after the hindu had done it and we did one another follow up in sabrang but it was these journalists from the hindu who had met him who just put out this appeal to fellow journalists that can you all help contribute so all of us are now contributing 2000 rupees a month so that he can continue to go to school and then go to art school you know that kind of thing so i think these small small stories are also important to tell uh, because uh, absolutely yeah yeah and and kalpana to answer your question g5a will definitely uh, take this up as as a project and in fact make it a kind of open source uh, kind of a platform so that you know people can almost yeah it must uh, be it must be yeah. when yeah yeah exactly so that people can in fact use it as a site to document and collect uh you know stuff like this so it really should belong to all of us and we we'll, we'll initiate the process immediately and you know we or as soon as we can uh, anuradha we mentioned kashmir only in passing but i think that would yes. be a very important yes. part of it and you know this young woman yeah, journalist yeah. a photographer masrat zera who uh, her photograph of that funeral of uh, you know a militant uh as yeah. she has had uapa slapped against her she's been recognized yep. for her work she's won awards and but at the same time for something that she did as part of her work her journalistic work she's been slapped on with this case she's only in her 20s you know she's been four years yeah. a photojournalist and a woman photojournalist in kashmir which is a even a greater challenge as she has told us many times so i think you know that story also needs to be part of this uh you know this story of uh, expression and art of resistance and i think whatever we call it i think we should think of some way of getting all this together in one place so that people can yeah, access exactly 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 because again that kind of critical and, mass and whatever really whatever 
yeah. brings a kind of confidence and a kind and, and and hope really you know that there is a solidarity of of some kind and i think that is something that sometimes i feel that uh, we as that uh, sort of uh, alternate voice or the other um voice i think we need to develop that kind of uh, critical mass so that there is and and constantly i suppose reinforce uh, our our positions and clarity on some of these things yeah in fact i would request anuradha to share with uh, the audience today how we collaborated uh, in the february of 20 uh, if you remember that when we brought the adivasi yes. forest workers to mumbai of course and we had that fantastic evening you know and uh, uh, of course what it meant to people who watched but what it meant to them to actually share yeah. their whole life because it was not simply a performance it was also a, a, a conversation about their life about the law they are fighting to implement the land rights struggle all of that you know and uh, they remember it as something which is very important to be able to connect to urban societies which may or may not be aware for a variety of reasons for the kind of struggles they are doing you know so in fact pista if like mm. i mentioned to you i think uh, even then is that if if some of us could could really mm. even see women like this um seriously you know, and seriously. just to see the so, see the sort of um not only just the confidence but also just the belief com- and complete sort of um you know should i say um almost um uh, well just the just the belief i guess that 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 things will change and just yeah. their positive sort of attitude and just their whole uh, position of being so sort of um uh and also carrying it lightly you know it wasn't a light um and yeah. that i find yeah that i find amazingly um uh, empowering that you you know you don't oh, they're have having to be, fun they're having fun yours. all the time exactly exactly so we have to do more of that um, so so anuradha just in my, some my experience is the pessimists are those who sit back and do nothing the optimists yes. are those who engage and fight for change you know because they absolutely, engage, absolutely they believe that they can be changed and the pessimists and they, and they different skeptic. ways to do it and there are different ways to think of getting that change there are different imaginations yeah. and you know one yeah, thing yeah. which we decided to do in cjp i'm just sharing this with you because you're thinking on this archive sure. that what we are doing at cjp post tower engagement because we did a lot of this uh, hunger relief work during the covid crisis and did the best we could and fed fed about 50000 families in and around mumbai but we had a very intimate engagement with the migrant worker families and also what we've decided to do uh, after that is to start a cjp fellowship uh, with those communities yes. we are working with okay yeah, so for instance yeah, yeah. we have this amazing woman who's working out of palgar now who's part of the wadli tribe then we have this amazing fellow who's a van gujar from uttarakhand and mm. we have a migrant worker from bengal who are all cjp fellows and we are going to create micro sites on our website which will not be pisa or x or y telling their story but they will be telling their story exactly their own way, no no i i absolutely documenting I read their that journeys yeah, yeah 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 so it's and already we are getting such footage yeah. we are getting amazing footage no, no, about their lives you know actually this is a brilliant idea and i meant to tell you that and i i i uh, forgot but i think that actually kalpana could be the way forward for us as well mm-hmm. you know where we when we are talking of recording and of archiving yeah. um i i think this would be a great uh, um uh, sort of method and all of us really uh, work together on it so that's at least something we can look forward to and um i'm thinking this might be a good time to bring in uh, questions kalpana yep 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 yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so I'm just going to check. Um, okay, I'm not able to see the questions. Sorry, um, Kalpana, can you see them? One second. And there were quite a few in the chat, no? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, Maybe shut back and message them. Yeah, yeah. I can yeah. read them out if you want. How do you think we might protect artists and creators against the unlawful use of UAPA and such to prevent these creations from being lost? Where and when do we assert our freedom of expression? This is from Ritika Lalwani. Pista, you can uh, answer that perhaps. Yeah, can you? And I just I was reading another one. Sorry, sorry. What is the question? Yeah. I'm so sorry. I got distracted. And she's she's given another one. Yeah, yeah. How did she's got? Yeah. No, oh, that's that's Sukriti Sharma. That's another separate one. Yeah. 
sorry i started at the bottom there quite a lot at the top <laughs> yeah i know i know i know <laughs> don't don't worry how do you think we might protect artists and creators no against the unlawful yeah, use of yeah. uapa where and when do we assert our freedom of expression okay so i'll take the second part first we uh, we assert our freedom of expression whenever we feel that we are very strongly about something where we feel there is an injustice being done where we feel by, that by expressing ourselves we would mitigate that sense of injustice and tell tell a story that nobody is daring to tell so i think we need to we need to ensure that we ex, uh, exercise our freedom of expression at those times what do we do for those against whom uapa is this thing uh you know the ua there are many many there are many levels of answers to this it depends on how deeply you want to get engaged and i'm not one of those who believe that everyone wants to get deeply engaged so it doesn't matter if you don't but the thing is to also understand that the uapa is a very very draconian law which actually should not be on the statute book so the yeah. ultimate thing is to ask for a repeal of that law okay but you may or may not want to be part of that movement but you can do other things you can please, kind of find Lisa, you can you Lisa, can try, you can try and find of, out who these are at least those sections of provision that that this government has brought in where it's not just yeah. a terrorist organization but an individual can be called a terrorist no and, there's also a provision brought in in 2004 which was problematic which actually brings in the whole question of police officers confession and makes the bail 180 days instead of 30 days yeah. so anyway that's it's a detailed technical argument for which we can provide information but i think you need we need to know, have more information that do we need such counter terror laws are they going to really stop terrorism or are they used to actually counter dissent so that's one ultimate argument but apart from that i feel it's very important to humanize those who've been targeted under uap and that's where i feel that somebody who's not completely engaged legally or whatever can come in you can find out who was sarfura zargar is what she was doing as jamia coordination committee who was ishrat jahan whose father stan swami 84 three and a half year old man jesuit priest who kind of jumped the barriers of his church and went to the people of jharkhand and fought for their rights you know for him the people of jharkhand were his religion not the catholic uh, faith and he is being jailed because of the work he did so let's find out about who is being targeted let's talk about these people let's humanize them write letters to them in jail write letters by the hundreds of thousands in jail and demand on social media and other media that they should be released because there are some of us who are doing this all the time but we need to multiply those voices many fold you know so i think these are some of the things we can do but i think you know really humanizing those who are being targeted by this counter terror legislation is very important because unfortunately the regime and governments tend to blacken people's careers blacken people's characters and it's completely unfair they were simply protesting or like sudha bardwaj my very good friend from daipur she is an advocate who was fighting for the rights of adivasis in chatisgarh you know then she is a national law school professor in delhi why is she under uapa for the last 3 years you know on november 3rd was her third birthday in jail so we can find out about their birthdays days that mean something to them you know make something uh, so that their memories stay alive among people and a movement develops more and more creatively about the unfortunate number of people who are under uap we have a human rights defenders page on our website which is going to come up soon you know human rights defenders people who are either jailed or threatened with jail find out through such pages of our organization or any other there could be other organization find out about such people and humanize them talk about them remove the fear from yourself and others that we can't speak about such things i think that's the main thing yeah i think there's another one from sukruti uh, that at shahin bagh there was a reading corner yeah. there were study circles conversations mm. all in the most uh, commu- uh, community and democratic way yeah. how can we create and strengthen such circles of creative resistance yeah yeah permanently right it's so important it's yes. so important yes. we have one exactly. kalagoda festival exactly. once a year but you know we need to create these kind of communities all the time exactly. all the time you know? yeah. in fact i should tell you that during the emergency um because you know you couldn't gather because section 144 was like everywhere so there was no way to have public gatherings so there were many such study st- circles you know where uh, we met in somebody's house and whatever news we could get of what was going on and who was arrested 
what was going on, torture. We shared it with each other. If there's anything yeah. interesting, we got by way of reading because you know we were not. There was no access to even foreign media. There was no internet, so it was often people coming from abroad who would bring back newspapers like the New York Times or the London Times, yeah. which carried reports of what was going on in India. India because the press was not reporting it. So we would ourselves. I mean, I remember a friend of mine who used to type it on. It, you know, this generation doesn't know what a cyclo styling machine is, yeah. but yeah. So, or even a typewriter, <laughs> I guess. But they used to type it on this wax paper, which was then mounted on this machine. It was like a little printer, and you would cyclo style these sheets of paper with stories from the London Times, the New York Times, yeah. which gave you an idea of what was going. But all this was the result of our study circles, and we would go physically and post them in different post boxes because you didn't want them to be traced back to mm -hmm. one area. From where they had been posted, but these were like, you know, we everybody just came up with ideas or forms of yeah. resistance that you had to do during those times. Yeah. So I think I we guess, just have to think of more and more, and yeah. not everybody yeah. will go out publicly and speak. You know, I recognize that, and I think that we yeah. all of us who are kind of more active, I feel every little bit counts. It doesn't matter if you can't do the ultimate thing, but just do yeah. something for two hours every day. Two hours every day. That is very special, very focused. You know, towards one of these uh, causes, in whichever way that you are most comfortable with, because you must be comfortable with what you do. You know, you must be comfortable with what you do, and it's legitimate to feel worried and uh, this thing. And with everything you do, you get less and less worried, and uh, you'll collectivize your fear, like all of us have done at some point or the other. Uh, and uh, also be also be strategic. There's nothing wrong in being strategic. Okay, and being yeah. careful. I mean, please. I always tell younger actors, nothing wrong with it. You don't have to be. Think of the steps you're taking, why you're taking them, and take them. There's nothing wrong with it. There's no bravado here. Okay, but let's all feel strongly about something and do it because I think it's very important. Yeah. I think that's a wonderful sort of uh, closing remark because, Pista, I think in today's day we really need that um, that. Uh, advice and and just the 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 wisdom of that I think um, that you know it's also a, something for the long run. It's not something that you know you just do with quick sort of. It's not a fix quick fix. Uh, it's really something that we have to build and grow um, in a way that is is sustainable. Um, so I think that's uh, wonderful. So Kalpana, any any other thoughts uh, before we begin? That note was perfect for ending. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we look forward to more such conversations um, and really, really giving uh, more meaning to all the stuff that we do. So I think uh, this is a good place um, uh, to leave it at. And then um, everyone who is listening in, I just want to say that we're going to keep find some way of keeping these conversations alive um, uh, and where, where people can post, you know, questions and continue this conversation because it is one of those that keeps, that, that we need to keep going. So thank you, everybody. And thank you. Uh, thank you very, very much. See you soon. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you both.